Hello, and welcome to this CASAP Learning Bite. CASAP with a P stands for the Knowledge, Skills, and Attributes of Potential. It's a solution that works across an organization. Here, Bob Eichinger explores how the KSA Suite has leveraged the science to define the markers and drivers, along with practices of high potential identification. The uh, thing that I'm most excited about uh, at the twilight of my career is a tool called CASAP, which is the knowledge, skills, and attributes of high potentials. Uh, if you know my background, I've spent 50 years in talent management, succession planning, and leadership development. So I've been a practitioner, an academic, a consultant, uh, a founder of a talent management business and a creator of IP. So I was the head of leadership and succession planning at both PepsiCo and Pillsbury. I've had a deep dive focus into the area that is, I had a hand in creating the concept of learning agility, which is used by most uh, Fortune 500 companies today in their succession planning. I created the concept of Season Pro at Pepsi. I co-created the Nine Box, which most organizations use. I've created uh, Choices and Via Edge, which are both high potential identification tools. And now KSAP, this is my third. I had a hand in creating the meme of 70-20-10 which is what we call assignmentology and a piece of practitioner implementation uh, program called Talking Talent. I've now created three 360 platforms in my background and two uh, major development platforms, one the Leadership Architect and now the KSA Suite. So I'm excited about uh, CASAP and following the next, following the same design as the rest of our tools, Roger and I went back to all of the research on what is a high potential. We also studied biographies and autobiographies to see what people who ended up to be legendary contributors, what did they look like in the early years? And then we examined about 100 people we knew in common, both in line management and professional HR, and try to remember back when we met them 22 years ago at a conference, what did they look like? How did they speak? Uh, what did, were they doing at that time? And all of that has brought us to 12 drivers and markers that distinguish people in terms of who is and who is not a high potential. Those 12 drivers are supported by 25 specific practices uh, that support the drivers and markers. And as in the past, the drivers and markers and practices and behaviors can in fact be interviewed for. They can be detected by educated observers. And the KSAP tool can be used to estimate potential at any point across the timeline. The tool has all of the things that LM showed before the other four tools. So we've got sort cards, placemats, tally sheets, posters. We have uh, a couple 360 options and then we have something sort of pending a better term, Magnus Opus, meaning that we have a cross coding tool that codes potential into the other four tools and into 21 generic jobs so that you can make a connection between uh, potential and what kinds of individual contributor, manager, and leadership roles and practices might they be best at. 
So in order to get to my next point, I have to reiterate, not, not from an ego standpoint, but I've spent my entire career in talent management and succession planning. So I've taught HR in numerous conferences. I have spoken to big company offsites. In my career, I counted up, I think I have worked with 100 of the Fortune 500 companies over my 50 year career. I've written 60 books, tools and articles. I've written The Leadership Machine, which is the Bible of uh, talent management and succession planning. I've developed tools and I've actually designed and installed talent management and succession planning systems in companies. Next. Here, here's my position and, and I'll, I'll tell you a bit later about why I'm a bit frustrated. At this point in time, I think we know everything we need to know to be able to source, hire, and take early in career high potentials through the three performance libraries of starting at individual contributors, becoming uh, supervisors and managers fairly young in their career, and on to leadership jobs. We know that that requires the 70-20-10 finding at the Center for Creative Leadership. They have to go through a series of diva jobs, which are jobs that offer diversity, intensity, variety, and adversity, and report to the right bosses to end up being a legacy leader at the C-suite level dealing with the world of VUCA. Uh, I always forget what it is, but it's volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity, I think. We know from the research that it starts with having the right inborn stuff from the nature side, followed by the right opportunities from the nurture side to develop the 90 or so KSAs necessary over an entire career to become a senior officer. Now, the research is pretty definite. It's 4951. That's 50 years of research into the genetics of leadership. And we won't go into that now, but the twins research of twins raised apart, studied in later life when they find each other is that about half of what they are comes from genetic components or predispositions toward values, attitudes, behaviors, and practices. And about 51% comes from upbringing. A way to look at this is this uh, nine box chart. And this is a nine point scale. And being a legendary C-suite or at least a top manager in a large organization and be a legacy leader is a combination of having the right stuff on top, low, middle, high, and having opportunities to develop the 51% that it takes to develop some number of the 90 uh, competencies, skills, or practices needed to be a leader. Detail on this chart, on the left-hand side, and, and this sort of comes from sociology, that is uh, academics have asked themselves what makes a difference and in uh, childhood in terms of development, uh, this kind of research brought us Head Start and other kinds of early opportunity programs and big brothers and big, big sisters and uh, gifted and talented programs in elementary school. But what they look at is the quality of the opportunities is driven by five indices. One we know a lot about and that's socioeconomic status. 
it it comes down to the simple issue of can the family afford to buy a used trumpet so whether a kid can get in the band or night might in fact come down to the simple issue of whether the family can afford to buy or rent a musical instrument. The same is true about uh, buying an athletic uniform or having a chess set or being able to buy books. There's also an index called DIVA. We've talked about it. It's diversity, intensity, variety, and adversity. Um, if you live in a small rural area, uh, your family does not vacation. Uh, it's not the culture of that particular piece of society. You've spent all 18 years in a four mile by four mile small town in Southern Minnesota, which I did of 13,000 people. I thought International was the Wisconsin Dells. That's as far away from Minnesota as I got. Um, so DIVA means that in order to take the 49% genetic predispositions to be great in the future, you have to have experiences to go through to learn. And so there's a DIVA index. There's one called the quality of home life. So it has to do with the extent to which uh, home life is supportive. Um, uh, can they sign up for individual tutoring and coursing? Can they drive you to after school activities? Are they supportive of school achievement and athletic achievement and music and art? Uh, do they support being in the debate club? Um, how noisy is it at home? Um, is there a quiet place to study? Uh, is it clean? Is it healthy? Uh, is there food in the house and so on? The neighborhood quality index is sort of new and, and it's being looked at uh, in college admissions for uh, ch children who were born in scary neighborhoods where you could not feel free to go out and walk and play in the park and have a, a higher exposure to opportunities. And then the last one is SSQ, which is school system quality. Uh, there's a lot of press, as you know, about the nature of our school systems and the quality of education it's delivering. So. If you wanted to take a kid who had the 49% and ask yourself the question of 30 years later, are they gonna end up being a legendary leader in a Fortune 500 company? The answer to that is it depends. And it depends upon the quality of the experiences they go through. The way to think about this is down at the bottom, uh, we all start with 22 years of early life and education that goes through those five indices. So one question is, to what extent are you a high potential on the 49% of the nature predisposition piece? So that goes from zero to 100. Even if I'm 100, I've got everything I need to be a legendary leader. Um, the question is, have I had the diversity of opportunities to go through in order to develop the skills? So in the middle of that uh, visual, we've got the CASAL, CASAM, and CASAI three libraries, and we have 30 roles and 90 so practices that you would have to learn the lessons of experience over the length of a career um, in order to be a legacy leader. And in order to do that on the left-hand side, you would have to have the 70-20-10, 70, 20, 10, 70 meaning we know most of what we know through direct experience, so that's learning from experience, 20 from other people, and the CCL research says it's mostly bosses, 10% book learning and workshops and webcasts, and then 25% are uh, tough, crucible experiences, uh, tough, critical experiences or challenges that you have. 
so career pathing is probably the major tool of producing legendary leaders. And we know the roles, we know the practices, we know the lessons of experience you need to learn. We know even what sequence you need to learn them in. We know what jobs those lessons come from. Uh, and we know exactly how to do that. And then on the right-hand side, there's a bonus based on research that Carrie Bunker and Mike Lombardo did. We find out that potential can be developed. So. If you end up at age 22 with a five on a 10 point scale of whether you've got the stuff, the right stuff of potential, if you've got achievement orientation, if you've got aspirations, we have actually found that potential can be enhanced and developed over time. So, Here's what I think we know. And when I say we, I'm talking about all of us, including those of you who are listening to this webcast. Reputable practitioners, academics, consultants, vendors, all of us through the last 50 years, all pretty much have read the research. We've been to the same conferences. We have watched best practice organizations present how they do this. So. I think we collectively know the roles and practices and competencies that are needed. We know how valuable high potential people are in terms of return on investment. We pretty much know everything there is ever going to be known about what the hell is a high potential. What does it look like? How do you assess it? We absolutely know we can interview it and observe it. So uh, most HR professionals ought to be able to help their line managers get ready for the annual review by helping them assess potential. We know where potential comes from, it's 4951. We know what the 49 is and we know where to get to 51. We know exactly what those experiences are in terms of assignmentology. We know that potential can be enhanced and in the CCL research, it was called gag assignment, which is going against your natural grain. And, and participants actually gagged when they were given these assignments. So that's why we called it the gag assignment. We know exactly what they need to develop. Uh, we need we know what they need over that time. That is, they need coaching and sculpting and curating and mentoring. We know they need good bosses. And what we mean by good is that they need to be good coaches and mentors. We know that we need skilled HR professionals to run the talent management, succession planning, leadership development process. We know what that looks like. So my conclusion as an old fart is there is no question, maybe 5% might be left to the imagination. We know how to do it. Everything you need to do to have a steady stream of exceptionally talented candidates for future leadership roles, there are accepted non-debatable best practices. Now, I need to say that to show you the next slide. My first assignment out of graduate school was to teach line managers at a large food company you would know the name of to assess and make accurate calls on potential to get them ready for the annual review. So that was in 1975. Since that, I have done that with 100 companies. I dropped out of the field basically in 2009 and started to study uh, neuroleadership and neuroscience. And in the past two years, I got back into the consulting practice and I find myself in what's probably going to be my last assignment. I am now helping to teach line managers at a bank how to assess and make accurate calls on potential. What?
what the hell have we been doing for 50 years? Me and all the other experts, David Ulrich and Marshall Goldsmith and all of the people we've all heard at conferences, the 100 Fortune 100 companies we have watched at conferences review their best practices, the leadership machine, the leadership pipeline books. There is nothing we don't know. And yet I find in my 50th year in the business that most companies aren't doing this right. Every year, as you know, Accenture and McKinsey and Success Factors and Oracle and all kinds of companies do a leadership survey. And they ask CEOs and C-suite officers, what's the most important things you're worried about for the future? And as you now know, we're in the second war for talent and the majority of the officers say that aside from making money and growing the business, my biggest worry is talent. Can't find enough talent. Uh, our senior officers are not backed up. And then they ask the question, how do you think your organization is doing on talent management, leadership development, and succession planning? And they say, it's, we're not doing well. So every one of those 10 studies that are published every year basically has the same finding. Talent's the most important thing I'm worried about and we're not doing it very well. And as I have said, we know, all of us know what it is. So we know everything about what it is and how to do it, but collectively we're not doing it. And it, it's very frustrating since this has been my whole career that I've been trying to educate people. So as I watch the two clients that I'm working with now struggle with uh, talent management, succession planning and leadership development, I tried to sit back and think through what we weren't doing well 10 years ago when I left the field as a consultant and what I see now, and I went to a couple conferences to see what best practices were and they haven't changed. Um, and I, I listened to David Ulrich and Marshall Goldsmith and Alan Church from PepsiCo. So here, here's what I think the five things are that are not going well. The C-suite knows what to do, but they're not doing it. Why is that? Uh, they're terminally busy. Uh, the IBM study says that executives uh, ha do not get to do 81% of what they wanted to do each day. Mm. So they only get to do 19% of what they intended to get done that day. They're also short term oriented, that is, the pressures on quarterly results. There's a commitment issue. Uh, succession planning particularly is an elitist practice. And I go to conferences where, where companies get up and say, uh, we have a value on, on employees and human beings. And as a matter of fact, we call everybody in the company leaders. And we think we're optimistic, we're, we're strength-based. We, we think everybody can go to the Olympics. Everybody can be an NFL quarterback. Anybody can be the leader of the band. Uh, so so we're, we're trying to uh, be inclusive. And what's happening is that in the old days, when a leader, when you called someone a leader, it meant something. Uh, now it's different. There's a commitment issue about that. And I am sad to say as one of the thought leaders of the field is that we're still not getting the calls on potential right. Uh, Mark Efron, who writes articles from time to time criticizing the field, says that, that as he's working with clients, he finds that when they are promoting the people who they think are high potentials, they fail in the assignments, meaning that the call on potential wasn't right. 
And I'm seeing that, and I've, I've had extensive dealings with Alan Church from PepsiCo, who I think is doing this the best of any practitioner that I know. Um, that's right, line, line officers starting 51 years ago didn't know how to assess potential. And as of a week ago, as I watched these bank managers struggle with this issue, they still can't assess potential. And that's why I'm excited about the KSAP tool because the KSAP tool, I think, is the first one that's really going to help them make that call. Mm -hmm. We're not executing assignmentology. In other words, we know 70 20 10, our managers know 70 20 10. When we make that presentation on off sites and in leadership workshops, they all say, Yes, that's how I develop. People push me in the jobs, I didn't know what to do. That's exactly how it works. I believe in 70 20 10. That's fantastic. And then you have an open job and you present a candidate who's never done that job before. And those same leaders say, Well, I really need somebody who's going to hit the ground running. Uh, I can't take a chance on somebody who's not a proven performer in this area. I fully believe in 70 20 10, but not this time. <laughs> Well, guess what? It's never time. The fourth thing is I'm sort of getting disappointed with professional HR. Uh, those of you who have followed my uh, public speaking over the years, I believe that professional HR is responsible for this system. Um, when you put it in the hands of the line, it doesn't work right. Um, I Right now, I hear a lot of HR groups saying that we're a support function. Uh, we're here to help. We're here to provide guidance. The accountability for making calls on potential and moving people around in assignmentology is a line responsibility. Uh, I don't believe that. I don't think the system works that way. Uh, so I think HR has ba basically backed up from the responsibility that I left 10 years ago. And then there's also a noise in the system of, of uh, people coming on stream offering ways to fix all this stuff that isn't working. So the, these are the five problems, and I think uh, KSAP is a tool that we can all use to make this better. So if, if we just review those five quickly. Mm -hmm. Next. Um, the C-suite doesn't like doing this. Every group I've said, what if I told you that I've got a system, I've got blood tests and CAT scans and MRIs that could definitely identify potential. I'll do this for you. Uh, you uh, give me the files on your seven people and I'll have a group of professional potential assessors, put them through an assessment center and then I'll give you the results and then you can present that in the annual talent review. Every group that I've presented that to said, yes, bring it on. I don't like doing this. I never have. I'm not sure I know how to do this well. Yeah. Well, they know how to do it, but they just don't like doing it. Um, and if we said, I've got a tool called CASAP, you can use it as an assessment tool. You can assess your seven people. It generates a score on potential. And then you can use that score to determine uh, who you're going to offer in the talent review as future leadership. The other uh, commitment issue that we have is that uh, there is no customer for succession planning. There is, there is no stakeholder. Uh, one of my companies, uh, their succession planning is called uh, winning in 2030. So they're planning 10 years ahead, which isn't even very long from a succession planning standpoint. Well, none of them are going to be there in, in 2030. <laughs> so all of these people who have to take time to do all this stuff and present potential and defend their people and give up their high potentials to grow the organization, all of the other wonderful things that they have to do they're getting paid for quarterly results. 
they are not going to get paid for the fact that one person they found and hired off campus, trained, mentored, worked with, offered up to the organization to take tough jobs, ended up to be the COO. They're either going to be dead or retired in Florida, and they don't care. So we have a commitment issue that there is no stakeholder for succession planning other than who's going to be the next CEO or the next president. As I said, we still don't know how to make the call. KSAP does that. Next, the most important thing is opportunity management. That's the 51%. Uh, people have to go through the right jobs in order to develop the 90 practices that they need. And we know exactly what those jobs are, know what sequence they need to go through those jobs. We are not doing it. We've talked about HR. I think HR has gotten a little soft with the strengths movement and everybody's a leader and everybody can be developed. Uh, to me, at least, when I stepped back in and went to a couple of conferences and watched HR professionals, the, the field has gotten sort of toward the soft side. Mm -hmm. And then the last one has to do that the noise in the system, the strengths movement has done a lot of damage to the quality of succession planning and the call of potential. Um, Inclusion is absolutely important. Diversity of teams is important, but the major diversity and inclusion movement has sort of scared people away from making tough calls. So that's also in the way. So I think we know exactly what we need to do. I think you know exactly what needs to be done. The issue is what Dave Ulrich calls the knowing doing gap. We know exactly what we should be doing, but in fact, we're not doing it. You can always visit us and see what we're up to at uh, teamintelligent.com. You can see our recordings of previous webinars or musings on our YouTube channel there as well. And we hope that maybe you'll take a moment and like us or follow us on the uh, LinkedIn business page. And I would just say thank you very much for listening and make it a great day.